Yes, tonight, to, uh, tonight we are going to uh, the eastern parts of India for the second time in our lecture series and it's still less explored and especially our visitors from abroad are most likely, um, you know, have never been to Odisha. So I have never been to Odisha, so I'm very excited about this, to hear more about Denkanal Palace. And um, every palace has a different story. Every generation has a different story. Today we're doing something um, different from before. We will be focusing on the crafts tradition. And I'll have more to say about this in a minute. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit, just a, a few minutes about the Center for Historic Houses. We have a few new listeners uh, who might not be familiar with the center. It's a new initiative that I started last year. We had an international conference um, on water and heritage, which is one of our important research areas. And this is just a short calendar to go through so that you know um, what we are doing at the moment and what we will be doing later this year in, in case you are interested to collaborate or participate or just uh, join in. So we are having the lecture series um, um, Resilience, Historic Houses of India and their Custodians. And um, I've also learned an enormous lot from this lecture series during the pandemic. Um, and uh, we wanted to do it only during the pandemic and during the lockdown in, in the summer. But we've had so much interest and we've had a number of um, palaces contacting us. So we will continue, uh, continue it. Um, um, afterwards as well, but not every Friday, because we have many other projects as well, and we are not able to cope up with everything. So we'll probably do it um, in the first week and in the last week we are um, discussing the format at the moment. In September we are holding a round table, which will be a closed event, um, mainly for the owners of historic houses and, and, and managers to discuss uh, for uh, business plans in response to the pandemic. In October, well, we'll be starting with various workshops for heritage professionals um, dealing with the question of heritage interpretation with a particular focus on the colonial legacy and the British Raj. So currently we are discussing this with the University of um, Oxford Heritage Network and the National Trust in the UK. And there are a few other institutions who would like to participate from other countries and we are very keen to have this kind of again collaborative work and you can see this from the center we collaborate but it's also really not only based in india but we are really having this discourse with the entire world and we feel uh, this is this global in, uh, initiative and approach is very helpful and really leads to kind of best practice in scholarship and um, also heritage management um, ongoing as a project of rejuvenation of traditional water bodies, which coincides with the uh, university project of Adopt a Village. So we're particularly looking at the villages in, in Haryana, and I'll show you um, a slide about this in, in a minute. Uh, our two research, main research areas at the moment, we are usually thinking in about three to four years, um, are water and heritage with my personal interest in lake palaces. And, um, material culture and the colonial legacy with a particular interest in Sir Edwin Lutyens and furniture design at Rashtrapati Bhavan. So this uh, I mentioned uh, the rejuvenation of water bodies. Here are some photographs of Haryana and um, this is what it looks like and um, actually my daughter took these photographs and um, um, we are currently planning a very exciting project uh, with two landscape architects in Delhi, Minesh and Nandita Parikh. They have collaborated for a long time with Billy Johnson, who is a very famous landscape architect in the US. And he's particularly well known for his wonderful uh, adventure playground in Central Park in New York City. So we are actually planning to do something like this in Haryana um, for, for the people alongside with the uh, water body rejuvenation. And this is actually, this is how I came across it. He, um, the architects did this beautiful uh, water garden for um, um, the Meridian Hotel in, in Jaipur and um, using the kind of charbag design um, and um, so this is how I came across it it's wonderful that you know I don't want to distinguish between this is the palace this is the kind of high-end design and this is the kind of low-end design for me design is always good design or bad design it doesn't you know I don't differentiate it so I'm really thrilled that actually someone who did something so so beautiful, he will use the same passion and the same emphasis and detail um, for a village project. And I 
think this is exactly what design should be like not a kind of um, patronizing you know um, you know in the village we don't need to do something special and, and this is something I'd like to announce today. This is an, a new initiative of ours, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to announce it today, and especially with Denkanal Palace, because we really have here uh, two uh, ladies where you think there's an army behind them, but there's not. <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, so much work depending really on, on, on individual people. It's amazing what I've learned about it. And especially now with the pandemic, we are talking about very serious existential threats, a question of, you know, where to buy food if there is no income. This is the situation we are facing. Um, um, in, in rural areas in India. And um, one um, initiative that you did was um, reaching more than 600 um, artisans. And I think really something like this is an amazing initiative. And, um, and we would like to offer the support. So what we thought about is, is the Palace Garden Collection. Because we want to work with artisans, give them the opportunity to earn money. And um, also, um, we want to create something that is useful for everyone at the moment, because, you know, this is a, a situation where we don't know how it will end. People don't know about their jobs. And if they are entrepreneurs, they don't know about how to generate income. It's a very serious situation. So we thought something that everyone needs at the moment is something like um, a garden. I noticed a lot of people are... Uh, doing gardening including myself and we sometimes had food shortage where we live so um, i felt it was actually really good to be autonomous and to have also organic vegetables in the garden and so we thought crafts people could create beautiful containers or garden accessories like you see here we have a wonderful a tradition of um, baskets in in odisha but of course we have palaces with uh, which we are working all over india and each one has a different kind of set of traditions and so on it could be metal work it could be um, you know any other materials and um, the, we could then bring the kind of palace garden to people's homes you know whether it's a kitchen garden herbal garden or mosquito repellent plants or something like this um, we are thinking about seeds we need to work out how uh, how it is but this is basically the idea of the palace garden project combining this with palaces and um, artisans to help them um, during the pandemic and i really hope um, that you will all be participating. I said it before, so please use this um, event as an, an interactive event. We will be sharing some images of um, objects uh, that you can buy or order uh, from the uh, palace. And we would really like to encourage you to also share which of these objects you would like. So you can really participate in the kind of curation of these objects. We want to establish a digital catalog that can then be shared. We also will share this on our webpage and I'm coming to the next announcement today. We are actually launching our webpage, the Center for Historic Houses webpage. And this is it. I'm really very proud about this. And again, we have so many people um, behind the scenes and especially um, interns working um, for the center. They have done an amazing job. I'm immensely grateful. And just to give you an example, you know, one um, associate working with the center had a, a tooth extracted yesterday. And while she was at the dental practice sending emails to the speakers, you know, doing the planning, I mean, not even taking one day off. I mean, this is the kind of engagement of, of students that we have. And, and this is really very special to me. And I'm immensely grateful. I wouldn't be able to do half of what I'm doing without the help that I have. And some of these students are very young. In fact, you know, Sima who's been involved in this, uh, is just graduating from high school and what she's been doing and the willingness to learn new things, um, new digital skills has been amazing. And again, I would say the, the pandemic is a wonderful opportunity of learning new things um, for all of us. And uh, we also really like to enjoy to use the kind of digital forum. So please, um, you know, um, students, if you could share the address again with our attendees, um, www centerforhistorichouses.org. Um, this is where we will share announcements. We'll also have a, a section where all the palaces uh, with uh, which we are collaborating will be able to share their news, share their initiatives. So it's really kind of uh, not, not a kind of stale web page, but it's really meant to be 
uh, you know, very up to date and um, important for people who like heritage. We will also share um, a calendar with heritage events. We just, you know, need, we are developing the webpage more and more. So we are just at the beginning and we are very, very excited to have this. So please have a look at it. We have videos, we have our various social media handles. We are really uh, present everywhere from Facebook. We have a very, very active Facebook group, Center for Historic Houses of India with about 2,900 members and I think more uh, according to the statistics about 80% of them are very active. Many of them are owners of historic houses, heritage enthusiasts and heritage professionals and uh, it's really wonderful to see to see this forum and the lecture series is really it's you know really bring it, brings everything to life so rather than having only the digital content we really try to combine the digital content with the kind of real life interaction. This said, um, this is a very brief overview of all the lectures we've done with the different themes. So while we have the beautiful narrative and the power of um, you know, storytelling from the owners of historic houses, we kind of extract a kind of theme for it. So we'll have, you know, uh, something like Bhavnagar, where the owners are um, uh, doing heritage initiatives, are, heritage, are having heritage groups. We have others with living heritage, such as breeding of Navari horses, and the only uh, school in Asia for horseshoes, you know, and how to, uh, a farrier school it is called. Here we have another family participating with a library. So each attempt is so different, all of them are having an enormously important impact on society. Um, here we have an example of Nimrana, for instance, this is what the house looked like originally and this is what it looks like now. I mean, this is a miracle it's, um, and you need resilience in order to do something like this, hence the title Resilience for this lecture series. Um, and here we also like the uh, Venice Charter propagated by ICOMOS really needs to be changed, you know, in the sense of the Venice Charter says that in the moment, in the moment you add a new addition to a historic house, it needs to be different from the old. And, you know, just look at this example, nothing is different from the old. You use the old as an imagination and a guideline to continue. And this is a very legitimate, I think, and, and wonderful way to go forward. So where I think the West can actually learn from the East by looking at these very creative, innovative, and very appropriate adaptations um, from historic houses. The last one we had is also very exciting, um, also in the sense of uh, the collaboration between different religions and the peaceful the coexistence between the religions. And the many surprising stories you wouldn't find in history books if you listen to the narratives of the owners, where you really see that a Muslim is um, ordaining a Hindu priest, that an, a Hindu is actually uh, put, uh, performing the coronation of a Muslim ruler. These are the stories we don't normally hear. And this is really beautiful that you actually see this kind of living history in the example of this particular um, palace. With this, I'm coming to my usual um, <laughs> uh, quotation about resilience leading over to our uh, guest lecturers now. Although suffering and challenge demoralize some human beings, others cope and construct instead. Rather than grinding to a halt, certain people hurdle the obstacles or creatively maneuver around them. They even make something positive out of the negative situation. In the face of crisis, they not only survive, but they thrive. And here again, we have have two very resilient ladies who've done a wonderful job. Um, I'm handing it over. And um, if you would like to just quickly introduce yourself and then we do the screen share and you can start with your presentation. Thank you very much for taking the time out and preparing this wonderful presentation for us. So I need to go stop share. <laughs> Oh, you are muted. Let me just uh, unmute you. Um, um, Kaveri, can you just help out, please? Yes. Yeah. Great. And what I should say, um, uh, what we also want to do differently, tonight we want to share some images of you from the collection of Denkanal Palace. And we would love to hear your opinion of which of the items you like best, so we can take this into consideration when we curate the, um, um, the, the little kind of uh, brochure that we want to issue um, for our heritage collection from the 
palaces. And you know, if you wanted to share or you know, tweet it, uh, use Twitter or any other social media, you are very welcome to use these images that we will be sharing throughout the um, session. So now, can we hear you? Is is it working? You? Yes. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Namaste. Good evening. <laughs> Yes. Um, can I figure this out uh, a little bit more? It's fine. It's fine. Yes. We'll have to overcome, of course, technical challenges. You know, now we huge. Yes. It's a very small remote place. There are a lot of limitations, so we are uh, striving towards it. But uh, the talk, actually, my daughter will be telling you about the history of Tenkanal to start with and uh, then I'll go on to the renovation and restoration part of it and uh, how we incorporated the various crafts of Dhenkanal. We'll talk about the crafts of Dhenkanal and Orissa and then go on to what we did in our work during the pandemic. So she's just getting ready to share the screen I think. It will take just a few seconds and then we'll be able to see um, the presentation. And in the meantime, I can say um, um, to the audience, if you would like to collaborate with us, um, if you would like to participate in any of the projects, we are very, very you know, um, interested in collaboration and please get in touch with us. And also share my, um, my email address. Yeah, we have, yeah, the screen seems to be frozen. It worked really well just a few minutes ago. Um, yes, yes. Of course, yes. I think we're back, but my screen is yet to share. Right. Um, it will just take a few seconds, for you, so don't get nervous about it. <laughs> <laughs> we can overcome this, and I really ask the audience for your patience because we are talking <laughs> about a very remote area. And actually, you have the privilege of being able to travel you know, to this and participate in this uh, wherever you are in the world right now, which is actually really lovely. Yes, it's wonderful. Amazing. Yes. And I'd like to congratulate you, Mimi. It's a wonderful platform. We've been seeing all the posts and, uh, and I must congratulate your team. It is super efficient. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yeah. Yes. I'm very accomplished that I'm being able to do this. Once it's full screen. Are we full screen yet? Can I have, um, have you tried to double click? Yes, I think I'm going to try again. Um, IT, is anybody able to help and uh, advise? And Yes, ma'am. Actually, the problem is, I think, internet issue there. The problem is the uh, network, you think? Yeah, 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 network. Hmm. Oh, it, because I saw some wonderful images. And you see, the <laughs> yes. we also really wanted to do it not like a podcast because it is a visual meeting, yes. right? So it's really important for people. And it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to see, um, uh, you know, rare photographs and, you know, maps and, and all sorts of things. This is why we really, uh, you know, asked our participants to prepare these presentations um, that is I think you know a very good format I think we, we've in the meantime you know exactly yes Kaveri, we can we can share some images that you can actually use and um, you know if you could have a look at these images that would be really great and share them on social media or tell us which of the objects you think would be great uh, 
uh, to be included in the heritage collection that we are preparing. What can we do to help uh, with the um, uh, with the presentation? I'm just going to try and redo this in a few minutes. So if yes. someone could take over for a few minutes yes. and maybe how maybe your mom shall we do it the other way around? Maybe should your mom start with her initiative? Perhaps I think it's either way. I have to get the presentation back yes. on. Right. So um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'll just if we could have someone take yeah. over for a bit, or we could right. Okay. Good. So um, you know, why do um, uh, why don't we have a look at some of these images for the uh, presentation? So if, if I can ask the audience, are you able to download these images or see these images that we are sharing with you? Um, you can uh, you can use the chat box uh, to uh, write your answers because this is important. <laughs> Not yet. Okay, uh, Kaveri, because I see these images, but I also cannot see, I click to open, okay. Yes, I can see them. So, you, I think you need to um, click on the little arrow to download and then click again to, uh, you know, I could go to screen share, but I'm not sure if I kind of mess something up and then um, the ladies might not be able to share uh, their screen. I can do it. I can screen share, screen share so that we can look at the images together in the meantime. So, yes. And then maybe the um, mom can tell us a little bit about it. Okay. Um, so this is one where we can see also the crafts uh, person and um, um, can we have a comment maybe from, um, from Denka now? From the family, because of, in the meantime, I okay, have talk. Uh, yes, so yes, uh, Mimi. So this is a this is a, a the, the Dokra art, which is actually as old as the Indus Valley civilization. It's four thousand years old, and the artisans use the lost wax technique, uh, which is you, they make fine wires out of beeswax and then anted uh, mud, and it's all done freehand. There are no molds involved. And then it's sort of put into a furnace and brass is poured over a nozzle which they leave. And uh, then of course it's broken out and it has to be polished. And uh, the oldest uh, image or uh, figure that we have as an example of this art form is uh, uh, the dancing uh, girl of Mohanjodaro. So uh, this is a village very close to us. It's just about seven, eight kilometers from Dhenkanal. And this village was set up uh, by one of our ancestors. So it's very, very sentimental for us. And um, so from what you last told me, um, it, it's basically uh, the, the people in the village produce it, but also sell it. They usually sell it during fairs or in front of temples and so on, outside of temples. Um, and all of this is not happening at the moment. So yes, yes, Mimi. So they basically, uh, yeah, they sell, they sell at exhibitions, at fairs, and uh, you know, the village hearts, the weekly markets. And uh, since the pandemic has broken out, they've had no means of uh, selling because all, all, everything's come to a standstill. There are no exhibitions, no markets. They have no availability to raw material. Uh, they haven't been able to procure raw material. There are no orders coming in. Also, the bar, buying power of people has lessened. So uh, with all that, each and every artisan, and uh, it's huge, and Odisha, there are so many skills and crafts and arts, and they have all taken a great hit. And it's going to take a while for them to come out of this. And uh, we are in our own small way trying to help because we have been working over many years with various arts uh, and crafts. So, uh, yes. So I'm opening a few others um, from my collection in the meantime. And just let me know, but how do we know whether the, the, the uh, presentation will be uh, ready? because she will not be able to share unless I stop sharing. This is the kind of only odd thing. Yes, so so I'm, I'm actually know. going to try and do this She's one trying. time. Yeah, okay, good. Y yes, here yeah, I am. I'm just going to answer a question that is this passed on traditionally. So this art form is passed on through generations and generations. And uh, so that's where there, there is a problem now because the younger generation do not want to continue with this. It's too tedious, it's not paying enough. 
and we have more and more of the younger generation branching onto other things, you know, leaving their art uh, and craft. So that's a pity. So we have to make it uh, you know, attractive enough for them to continue and work towards that. Yes. Um, is my screen visible now? Is it yes, visible? It is. Great. Yes. Okay. That's so, fine. That's fine. I think now I'm going to start and I'm, I'm extremely excited um, to be there talking you through the history of my home and my family and thank you so much for being here and uh, and bearing with all my technical glitches and I, I do hope you ask lots of questions and uh, enjoy what we're about to tell you. So um, for those of you who are new to India or Orissa, um, Dhenkanal is located in central Orissa um, and you can see it on your map. So it's Nestled among, so Dhenkanal is nestled among the Garjat Hills and is only 75 kilometers from the capital, which is Bhuvaneshwar, which is also the closest airport to us. And it's just an hour and a half um, drive from here. Now about the erstwhile state of Dhenkanal, it was the third largest in Odisha and it had an area of 1,463 square miles, um, comprising of 1,090 villages. And, um, so this area is, just a second, this is, okay. So this area is named after um, its fiercest tribal chieftain, Tenka Sabar. And as the area was bounded by three streams or Nalis, it came to be known as Tenka Nal. And many tribal chiefs tried to annex these lands but failed until one day he was defeated. And at his defeat, before he was beheaded, um, he warned his captain that if they disrespected his head, their dynasty would never flourish. And this was a legend my ancestors believed when they arrived in Tenkanal to set up their kingdom. And till date, um, we pay our respects every morning to what is, believe, what is believed to be the place where he was beheaded. And we've even placed a stone there to commemorate that spot. Now coming to my ancestors, um, Raja Hari Singh, along with his two brothers, Govind Singh and Janardhan Singh, traveled from Rajputana to Odisha to integrate themselves uh, into the court of the king of Odisha and um, build their fortunes here in the land of Lord Jagannath. And Govind Singh became the prime minister, Janardhan Singh became the finance minister and Hari Singh the commander of the army. To expand the Gajpati Maharaja's kingdom, Hari Singh began many, many conquests towards the Deccan. And upon defeating the rulers there, he um, was gifted the Meena Ketan, which is what you see on the left side of the screen, which is two fish holding the flag of victory. He was gifted a turban and a dagger, which he then went and presented to the Gajpati Maharaj. And in um, delighted with his prowess, the Gajpati Maharaj gifted these articles back to him, along with um, Karmal Patna to set up his own um, kingdom. And in 1529, Raja Hari Singh established the kingdom of Dhenkanal and he was followed by a long list of distinguished rulers, um, each with a history worth mentioning, but I will start by talking of um, Raja Chilochan Mahindra Bahadur, who is best remembered for his defeat of the Maratha Bhosles of Nagpur, which is chronicled in a poem written by Brajanath Barajana, um, known as the Samar Tarang, which till date is studied at the University of Odisha, the Utkal University. And so it so happens that with the decline of the powers of the Gajpati Maharaj in Urissa, the states here came under the four powers at that point of time, which were the Mughals in Delhi, um, the Nawabs of Bengal, the Bhosles of Nagpur, and of course the British that were gaining power then. And Dhenkanal as a tributary state paid its peshkash or tribute to the Bhosles of Nagpur. Um, the tribute was then collected by a trusted subedar of the Marathas. And in this case, it was a man known as Raja Ram Pandit who was stationed at Katak, which was the stronghold of the Marathas at that point of time. However, um, the subedars often collected the tribute arbitrarily. And in 1780, um, Raja Ram Pandit doubled the Peshkash, which uh, Raja Chilochan refused to pay. The subedar then brought his army to Dhenkanal, but was, but was subsequently defeated which we're very, very proud of. Um, but at the same time, the Bhosleys of Nagpur had decided to invade the British stronghold in Calcutta, where at that point of time, if those who are familiar with history will know that Warren Hastings was governor general and Chimnaji Bhosle, the son of Muroji Bhosle, the head of the Bhosleys, was on his way to Bengal. He was approached by his subedar who told him of this rebellious king of Dhenkanal and they decided to um, come and teach him a lesson. 
and Chimna ji took a section of the army and went to war with Dhenkana. The war lasted 18 days and after which they were cancelled into a treaty as the Maratha forces were depleted. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Warren Hastings, so what you see on your screens is a letter addressed to David Anderson discussing um, the Nagpur advance in Orissa. And he kept an eye, so Warren Hastings kept an eye on what was going on here because that would um, affect how they dealt with the Marathas when they came. And he actually paid enough uh, damages to Chimnaji to return to Nagpur, something that he had to actually answer for at his impeachment in England much later. Um, so Tenkanad was victorious over the Marathas and this made the Gajpati Maharaj very happy. And he bestowed upon Raja Trilochan the title of Mahindra Bahadur, which um, for his use and the use of generations that came after him. Now you see here, um, Maharaja Bhagirat Mahindra Bahadur, who was a man of profound learning, and he actually began a new era of progress in Tenkanal. His able governance actually led him to receive the title of Maharaja from the British. He laid the foundation um, for the Tenkanal Palace and the oldest portions of the house were built by him. He built a palace befitting a king, yet not too florid. Um, and a Sanskrit scholar, he wanted to protect and promote the culture and learning um, of his state. And he, he, was very, he was a very liberal king, so he actually spent 13% of his revenue on education and gave land to learned men who decided to come and set up in Dhenkanal to increase the culture of the area. Um, he invited scholars, craft persons, and actually set up a lot of villages for weavers, bell metal artisans, the dokra workers, filigree workers, among many others. He even gave rent-free land to the potters and barbers, carpenters included, as he considered them essential to society. And what you see here is one of the first buildings that was built um, as, as part of Dhenkanal Palace. You can see the exquisite stone carving, and these were uh, carvers that were set up by him. He also gave land to the monks of the Alek Mahima Dharm at Joranda, which is 25 kilometers from us. And he then became a disciple of this philosophy. So the monks of this philosophy are believers in the thought that the world is one. And if for the progress of the world, a single life must be sacrificed, then so be it, as they themselves are part of the world. Now these monks, um, if you see closer, um, cover their bodies with the bark of trees, um, not fabric. And they grow up their hair um, and they travel from village to village, spreading their philosophy of the world is one. Um, and guests that visit Dhenkanal Palace today also visit Joranda um, for the evening arti, which is the prayers, of the, the daily prayers of the temple, which is really a sight to see. Um, when W.W. W. Hunter visited Orissa, he, he's a great historian and he writes about Dhenkanal that it may not have been the largest, but it was the most civilized state of Orissa in the 1870s. Maharaja Bhagirat Mahindra Bahadur also donated towards the setting up of the Ravenshaw College, the Katak Printing Press, which is the first printing press of Orissa, as well as the medical school and college at Katak. Upon his death, um, the state came under the court of wards, and his son, Raja Dinabandhu Mahindra Bahadur, was still a minor. Um, unfortunately, he too passed away in 1885, uh, leaving behind an infant son. His wife, Rani Annapurna Devi, initiated the building of many temples, reservoirs, and planted many orchards for the benefit of the state. Coming to their son, uh, Rajashi Shurpita Mahindra Bahadur, and his wife, Rani Krishna Priya Devi, um, he took over the state in 1906 and was a well educated and intelligent ruler and was anxious to promote the wealth of people. In order to combat um, illiteracy, he ensured that primary and secondary education was made free. He even sent students abroad for further studies and then developed the cottage industry set up by his grandfather, including weaving, carpentry, and metal works. He set up a printing press in Dhenkanal and then built many landmark buildings that till date are used here, including the hospital. Um, the BB High School, which is the Barajana High School, which you see at the top right. Um, he, he, he built the court building, which is um, currently used as the collectorate, which is the bottom image, as well as the Rang Mahal, um, which is the Darbar Hall, as, and also acted as a space for performances that were patronized by him and is even used by us um, for our specially curated performances. 
He even established Chau in Dhankanal with the help of the king of Mayurbhanj at that time. And his wife, Rani Krishna Priya Devi, was an accomplished poet and musician and wrote a book known as Harmonium Shiksha, which was a guide to learning the harmonium. Raja Shurpata Mahindra Bahadur also donated to the Allied war effort um, a sum of almost five lakhs, as well as an ambulance that you can see here in 1916. Now, his welfare schemes earned him the title of Rajrishi. Raja Shankar Pratap Mahindra Bahadur was only 14 when his father passed away in 1919. Um, he was educated at the Rajkumar College, Raipur. Um, he's also my great, it's a great moment of pride to be talking about him. Um, interestingly, the coat of arms and the motto of the school today were designed by him. And they translate to, a king is respected in his own kingdom, but a learned man is respected world over. And his policies were formulated along these lines. He abolished untouchability and set up centers to combat the spread of leprosy. He established dispensaries with state-of-the-art equipment and doctors and lady doctors, and he even eradicated smallpox in his rule. His education schemes included the building of more co-educational schools, and he encouraged tribal students to enroll in mainstream schools as well. He even extended education to the prisoners and they were provided with books, newspapers, healthcare, vocational training, and were often reintegrated in society. Um, and it is said that in his rule, he never signed a death treaty. He divided his judiciary and executive and ensured proper training of his officers. And he believed, and I quote, the days are past where rulers could be unapproachable and autocratic. He joined the Boy Scouts movement and received a Silver Cross medal for saving a young boy from a blazing hut. He even led the Indian delegation to the World Scouts Jamboree in Holland upon the request of Viceroy Linlithgow. Um, the Banaras Pandit Sabha also bestowed upon him the title of Vidya Sagar. He was associated with the Magic Circle of England. And for those of you familiar with uh, magicians, he, even, he is said to have even taught PC Sarkar a few tricks. Um, when he lost his grandfather at the age of 14, um, he was mentored and tutored by Mr. Janki Nath Bose, who was the father of the freedom fighter, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. Having known each other through their childhood in January 1941, when Netaji escaped India in search of armed assistance for the freedom struggle, it is said that it was a Tenkanal number two Austin car that was used by him. And this put him and uh, my great grandmother Rani Ratna Prabha Devi under the suspicion of the British. In 1948, he was one of the first rulers to accede to the Indian Union. He was also elected to the Legislative Assembly in 1957 and then to the Rajya Sabha in 1964. Now, my great grandmother Rani Ratna Prabha Devi, who I've actually had the good fortune of interacting with in my childhood, was inspirational in her own right. She was a princess of Saraikela, um, a very well-read woman, and she was multilingual. She, actually, she broke Parda and pioneered the Girl Guides movement in Odessa and led the Indian delegation to Philadelphia in 1934. She was an elected member of the Legislative Assembly and an author. In 1965, my grandfather, Brigadier K.P. Singhu, was recognized as the Raja of Dhenkanal. He was one of the youngest members of parliament and held six portfolios, under three different prime ministers, including defense, information and broadcasting, and culture. He is also the only active uh, parliamentarian to have fought a war, a distinction he holds because of his services rendered in the war of 1971. An officer of the Territorial Army, he was awarded the Ati Vishish Seva Medal and retired from the Territorial Army at its highest rank, that of a brigadier. Like his father, he is a keen sports person and is the founder president of the Asian Rowing Federation and helped the setting up of the Rowing Federation of India. He was the first Indian to empire the rowing events at the Olympics and even led the Indian contingent as a chef de mission at the 1988 Seoul Olympics. With the support of my grandparents and their encouragement, my parents were able to begin restorations and pioneer palace tourism in Urissa almost 30 years ago. And now I'll hand over to my mother, who I think will tell you a little more about her journey. So, um, hello, and uh, let me start by saying our journey 
began 30 years ago after my marriage in 1990 as a 22-year-old bride. My husband and I uh, saw tourism as a future for the property in order to maintain it. At that time, tourism in Orissa was not where it is today. It was lacking initiative and infrastructure. Wary of the response we would receive, we began our renovation one room at a time. At the end of the day, it was our house and legacy that we had to uh, maintain. Uh, we started welcoming guests as a heritage homestay with our very first room. And because the first, uh, we were the first palace to start heritage tourism in Orissa. I'm talking of the days when uh, an airmail or an aerogram would take 14 days to reach us from England. We would go to the airport with a picture of our guests in order to recognize and bring back the right guests. En route, if God forbid, if the guests required the facilities, we had only the bushes to offer. <laughs> Today, we run the palace as a heritage homestay with 13 rooms, a well-equipped library, a guest lounge, and the palace shop. The Denkanur Palace is the only fort come palace in Orissa with a ramp leading up to its only entrance. Since it is built on the slopes of a hill, it has been built on four different levels overlooking the town. Visitors to the palace are pleasantly surprised to find a garden at the third level, which you see on the right hand top corner. The palace as it uh, stands today was not built all at the same time, but portions were added uh, by its various rulers according to the requirements. The main portion, which was the oldest and was built in the colonial style, you'll see the slide uh, in the next, okay. A colonial style with the columns and blinds, similar to that of Bengal, the architect being a Bengali. It was furnished in a European manner, and these apartments were lived in, so therefore they needed very little re restoration. Uh, the block on the right hand side, uh, lower corner, is where our guest uh, wing is. And this was the wing where, uh, as the family grew larger, a block of apartments, which is this in the picture, was added during my grandfather-in-law's time, as there were six brothers and their families. Now, with time, these the, the families and the brothers moved out of the palace, and these fell vacant and were not in use for many, many years. This block called for a lot of repair and maintenance. There was no electrification or plumbing anywhere. These were also the days of the manual pulley fans, oil lamps, wood boilers, and the walls over the years had been tarnished by the smoke, rain, weather. Odisha, unfortunately or fortunately, has very heavy rainfall and 100% humidity, which adds to our problems with the upkeep. Although the local uh, stone walls used in the construction of the palaces in Odisha, the walls are plastered with lime and mortar, and uh, these buildings need a coat of paint often. The palace walls being 18 inches uh, thick and to get electrification or plumbing done on these was really a daunting task for us. There were two drop toilets catering to six rooms and we did not want to bring them down. So we just made them functional and uh, comfortable internally. You see this in the picture, the uh, restoration and renovation work. Both my husband and I uh, were sure we did not want to touch or change the outer structure no add anything new, only work on the interiors to keep the sanctity intact. The kind of skilled labor we required to carry out this work was of course not available in Dhenkanal anymore. And we had to bring in labor from Kolkata and put them up for months for the tiling, laying of the marble, plumbing, and various other jobs. They in turn trained our local men to work with them. Material, fittings, marble, furniture had to be brought in, uh, in trucks from Kolkata and other cities. Since my husband and I share a passion for it, we supervise the work personally and never hired an architect or interior designer. It's, it's been a trial and error journey, but we're learning, still learning. And uh, probably there wasn't one place that we traveled to and did not pick up an antique curio or crockery to bring back to the house. One had to also find furniture to match with the period we were working with. And I did regular religious rounds of the auctions for years to locate a Chippendale or Lazarus or something which would match with our decor. Coming to the crafts, uh, Odisha has been a cauldron of traditional arts and crafts since times immemorial. The ancient name Odisha, uh, of Odisha sorry, is Utkal, 
and that says it all. Its uh, etymological derivation is utkrish, which means excellence, and kala, which means craft. Most of the arts and craft evolved as a part of the Jagannath cult. So all the crafts were what started as services or seva for the Lord, and then they developed into various other, I mean, larger scale. The guest lounge, although renovated, uh, you just saw the picture. Uh, it, it's been renovated, but but still, every single piece, including the furniture, is old, and uh, most of it has been passed down through generations. While doing up the display cabinets, we did not want the usual shelves. So we took inspiration from the traditional uh, Pasapali sari design. It depicts the checkerboard or the Pasa game of the Mahabharat fame. Orissa has a large weaving culture. The weaving or ikat is done using the bandho technique or the tie and dye method, whereby the patterns are tied on the yarn before it is dyed or colored, then put on the loom. So a lot of our soft furnishing, bed cover, cushion covers, curtains have been woven by weavers from nearby villages. The aptic work of Pipli near the holy city of Puri is another craft we use a lot at the palace and uh, an example is on the right, the bed cover. Patachitra is an art which, date back, which dates back to the 5th century BC. It is uh, a narrative style of painting. The motives are from mythology. Traditionally, layers of cloth are pasted together using a mixture of tamarind seeds and uh, chalk. Uh, the, the, and a stone is then used to polish it. We have incorporated this art form on our walls and even our bathrooms. <laughs> we have uh, two young artists who are hearing and speech impaired and we try and give them as much as work as we can. The brass pits and bell metal workers also have a great presence in uh, and around Henkana. And uh, as you can see, the basin in the bathroom, we have used the hand beaten brass basin in many of our bathrooms. Our uh, service sets, our butter dishes are also all well metal. Then we have the Dokra art, which I just mentioned at the beginning of the session. Uh, the Dokra art, of course, dates back to the Indus Valley civilization. It's 4,000 years old. The artisans use the lost wax technique to create beautiful brass curios. They work freehand using fine wires made of beeswax and anthill mud. All of it is of course freehand. And uh, we have used this art in one of our, uh, one of our doors. Uh, all our door handles, candle stands and ashtrays are also made in Dokra. The picture you see on the right upper corner is the Jyoti Chitta or the Alpana as others would know it. So a rice flour is used and uh, these patterns are carried out freehand. You'll find them all over Orissa on the uh, facades of houses. And we wanted to use this. So we have brought it in. Earlier there was, you know, cow dung would put the, what was a coat and then there was the, the rice flour. But uh, so there's one wall we have used and other parts of the palace as well. Uh, coming to stone carving, the, the picture on the right hand side lower corner. So Orissa has been famous for its temple architecture and stone carving. The Konara Sun Temple is a standing testimony of the same. Venkanal too has a tradition of uh, stone carving. You saw the earlier picture of the carved mandap, one of the oldest structures uh, on our complex. We tried to match the workmanship on our doorway leading to the guest wing. The uh, facade was created here by our local uh, artists in Venkanal. It's a traditional uh, pattern from our temple doorway. The basket weaving industry has a strong presence and has been a part of our culture. We have used their skills to weave our bread baskets, our laundry baskets, and our waste paper baskets. Most of the cottage industries, as my daughter mentioned, were set up and grew under the patronage of our ancestors. And it is a, a very fulfilling feeling indeed to be able to carry forward that patronage in whatever small way possible till date. Coming to the aloe vera, now aloe way uh, is our in-house organic uh, aloe vera body care products. This is the cottage industry full of woman power and more power to us. It, tr it, it tries to give employment to women who are widows, single mothers. So the women pluck the aloe vera at our farm and the women process it at the factory too. The products we make are shampoo, body wash, hand wash, lotion and gel. And we use these for our guests in the, as toiletries in the bathrooms. 
during the pandemic, we also introduced the sanitizer, which has become a part of our lives now, and uh, distributed it also to our health workers and around town. A lot of the vegetables we require in our kitchen are also grown on our farm organically. Our milk and milk products are fresh from our dairy. We also make our own preserves and jam in-house. At Dentonal Palace, we love to curate experiences for our guests, such as tribal and classical dance recitals at the Rang Mahal, which my daughter spoke about, which is the performance hall and the garden. We organize Patachitra painting demonstrations by the artists. Trips can be organized to the handloom villages to understand and amaze at the process of weaving, explained by the weavers themselves. One can visit the Dokra artisans and even try their hand at the craft. The evening arti at the Alek Mahima uh, temple is a very, very pop popular pilgrimage. There is a large population of elephants in and around Henkanal. And if the trackers locate these majestic herds, we send our guests to see them. But then this, of course, depends on a little luck. Henkanal has also some historic sites uh, within an hour or two hours driving time. The ancient temples of Kualo, dating back to the 8th century BC, are an hour's drive from us. This is a cluster of eight uh, stone-carved Shiva temples, just about seven kilometer, 70 kilometers from us. They are beautiful. The Buddhist sites at Lalitgiri, Ratnagiri and Udaygiri are an absolute treat. There is a complex, uh, this is actually an entire complex of monasteries, viharas, kupas and form what was known as the Pushpagiri University. Um, they are comparable to Nalanda. These date back to the 5th century and 13th century BC. There is also a museum on the site, Meena Ketan. So Meena Ketan as a brand was born with an objective to encourage and uh, bring forth the rich handloom and handicrafts of Orissa. We have been involved since the past 30 years with the various artisans, such as the Dokra artisans, jewelry makers, potters, basket weavers, wood carvers, patachitra artists, uh, and the handloom weavers. Uh, I help uh, giving designs which are more relevant to today's living, modern day living, and bringing more utility to the old age old crafts. We have exhibited and showcased these through various platforms uh, all over the country and abroad, such as the Royal Fables, Vasutra, and uh, we recently had two fashion shows uh, through the CDS Art Foundation. We also sell through the palace shop. Now, during the lockdown, for the huge setback with no availability to raw materials, no orders coming in, nor any places to sell at all. Uh, such, uh, so, so, I mean, there are no exhibitions, nothing really for them to go to. And uh, we knew of their plight and my uh, daughter decided to give a part of her salary and my try and my school friend and my sister Radhika Raji Gaikwad of Baroda, who shares the passion with me uh, and myself, we chipped in and uh, started to buy some provision and reach out to these artisans who we were close to. We bought some of their product products and we shared these experiences as posts on uh, social media. We're just having a problem with that slide, but uh, so uh, yeah, so we, we received overwhelming response actually. And uh, we had help coming in from in various ways from various quarters, whether it was donations, people offering to help design our website, share our story and orders started trickling in as well. And these were people we didn't even know. We started to look out for more villages and more skills to help out. And uh, we reached out to blacksmith, bell metal and brass uh, smith, basket weavers, handloom weavers, potters, fishermen, drum makers, stone carvers, wood carvers, patachitra artists, toker artists, the list is long, jewelry makers and uh, straw craft artists. And it was about 17 or more skills that we've been able to reach out to in whatever small way. And uh, yeah, so it's a small act which has snowballed into something of a mission. And we have been able to touch uh, over 600 families over the past two, three months. Uh, my husband has driven us personally to many of these villages. Our staff would uh, pack at night all the provisions and we would head out in a tempo with all our tons of provision. Uh, and we have been uh, recognized by the HDFC Bank as neighborhood heroes for our endeavor during this pandemic. 
we now of course hope to take it forward uh, helping especially children because uh, when we were doing the round we came across many children with uh, down syndrome and uh, cerebral palsy and other handicaps and we are trying to help them you know reach out to doctors taking them to doctors and showing them the way as to what they are entitled to the policies which the government has uh, entitled to the, uh, entitled them to we are trying to get them wheelchairs and uh, other help so yeah I, i'd like to end here with a heartwarming quote by robert louis stevenson if a man loves the labor of his trade apart from any question of success or fame the gods have called him thank you so much for joining us thank you very much i mean this was just such a wonderful presentation and i think we all can see how important it is to share this with the wider world because i mean the level of detail using the local craft for door handles um, uh, paying attention to um, to the stone and 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 using this technique you know for the house um, in the readaptation i mean the level is is so subtle and i mean such an attention to detail and really doing everything you can to help the community i think at this stage it's or even you know using your own products i mean for for the house i mean it's really wonderful it's i really feel at this time we we need to step in and we need to share this with the wider world so that this can have a bigger impact and um, i think especially really from the audience you know this is not a kind of lecture where you can just sit and listen i really hope that you actually take this as an opportunity to say i can make a difference and you know if it's just you know we we can put together i think you know a digital catalog as i suggested with some of these beautiful objects that can be used you know any 10 dollars or you know 50 dollars 100 dollars will make a huge difference um, here and uh, we really should use the international audience and especially those who are working in the field of material culture to actually not only use it as a study but really do something in an activist kind of way to actually help the community this is a wonderful opportunity we are working at you know with the with the business school at the law school at general university we will create a, a, a complete business plan and we'll figure out how to transport it and you know even if it will take a little bit longer now because of lockdowns and so i really think you know it deserves our patience to really help now immediately you know these artisans and so on so this is really what what I hope to do, um, you know, with this project, not only as a lecture, but to do something concretely. Thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. And I really mm -hmm. think you know, it worked so well because we all felt we are really there, you know, you know, listening to what you had to say. I'm glad. You know, and um, this was really lovely. So um, I'd like to um, ask the audience now, we, um, you can either use a chat option or if you want to make a comment, uh, we can unmute you. We have a number of uh, conservation architects here with us. We have museum curators. I'd really love to hear from you um, um, and, and all the other guests as well. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much. And I think, you know, you see the audience is really absolutely thrilled. And you see, these are just the pearls. Everything you do. I mean, look at this effort. I still can't believe it. Um, and it should, it, 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 but it needs a forum because otherwise, you know, all the effort you put into it will just reach a small, and, and we are not even talking about 600 artisans. This is an amazing number. And we're talking about individual efforts, you know, but we need institutions to back this up. It cannot only be on the shoulders of one or two people, you know, we need a, a wider, you know, uh, help, helping, more helping hands, definitely. Um, Yes, so please, I'd like to hand it over to the um, audience. So if you wanted to ask a question, you see there is this option to raise your hand. There should be this option. <laughs> uh, yes, under reactions, or where is it? Kaveri? Yeah. Amy, can I interrupt you for a second? Yes, um, so I've got, I finally managed to get a slide which has a few pictures of our COVID and craft journey. So I'm just going to share my screen please. for another minute yes. so that everyone can. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, I, I really want to show this slide, off. Yes. <laughs> she <laughs> wants to show off. Yes, a bit. I want to show off a bit. Please do. These are the various crafts, like the the bell metal workers on the left corner. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, yes. yeah, the left and uh, lower corner has the bell metal artisans, and the uh, the blacksmiths on the top. With this little uh, child who's absolutely adorable 
and uh, then of course the, the villagers and their happy faces and smiles the kind of satisfaction we've got just that smile uh, then there are the patal makers they make these donas or plates and bowls with uh, leaves and of course that's our uh, rang mahal which uh, which is the performance hall which uh, turned into uh, our, uh, a storehouse yes. and where we packed all our provisions uh, so so you get an idea of it yes the next one Yes. <laughs> so yeah, we just wanted to show you that because that's what's kept us going so far and um, we hope to be able to do more and not stop. <laughs> Wonderful. And you see all the unintended consequences. Yes, you want to look at craft, but suddenly you, you hear, you find out the child and, you know, it's leading to more and it's leading to more. And so it's, it's, it's really, really wonderful. So, um, yes, can I have some questions or comments or from, yes, our, I, I also wanted to ask you about actually the uh, stone, the kind of stone that is used there. What is the stone, the local stone? And also when yeah. I look at the, yeah. Mm, or which, go ahead, uh, when I look yeah. at the original photograph the, um, you know, um, of the building, um, of course, we don't see the color, but it looked white to me. So do, what was actually the original color of the, of the palace? It was, it was plastered, Mimi. So at some point it was painted white. And uh, then there was a, a color of yellow, which was a lighter yellow. And uh, we used uh, green paint on the shutters or the blinds and the doors. And then somewhere along the line, we made it a darker yellow because, you know, with the weather and the kind of rainfall, we thought this would last longer. So it's a darker yellow. And we have actually removed the paint from the wood because this is wonderful wood. And uh, we've let it be uh, the natural color with varnish. Mm. So that. And coming to the stone, I mean, we, uh, Orissa, the architecture, there was various kinds. There was serpentine stone, there was soapstone, there was chloride, green chloride, and there was condolite. So what uh, was used at the palace is that reddish material, it's uh, the condolite stone, which we still use and it's also used at the Konarak temple, among other temples. It's a metaphoric stone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very interesting. Um, I'm just looking at the, um, at the, at the comments. Questions, to see yeah. Any <laughs> questions we have? And we had so many questions before you started. It's <laughs> very funny. Yeah. Um, yes, I have a question here. Did you have a family connection with the, um, with the uh, poet Tagore and the writer Tagore? Uh, not that I know of, but we are still researching, Mimi, and this has opened a whole Pandora's box because we are going to be visiting the archives in, uh, in Calcutta and Delhi again. As soon as we so, can travel. As soon as we yes. can travel. So no, not that, that I know of any records. I wish my mother and father-in-law were here there in Delhi. But uh, not that we know of, no, only Subhash Chandra Bose among some of the others, the uh, literary scholars, yes, but not Tagore. Right. Uh, can we just unmute Subhashis uh, Gosh, please, from uh, Kolkata? Hello, I'm pleased to see you. You know, some of uh, our attendants uh, had some problems initially, uh, uh, you know, finding the link, um, connecting with the link, but eventually they haven't given up. Again, resilience of the audience. <laughs> resilience. <laughs> and they participated, yes. Um, can, we, can we just un unmute him so that he can ask a question? Um, Kaveri, oh, wait, let me see, let me see whether I can do this. Um, I have asked to unmute. Yeah, yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah. Hello. yeah hi, how are you? <laughs> yes, very well, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's a fantastic presentation over I'm there. I'm so glad. We were very nervous. <laughs> and it's very, very informative also. So I was just wondering, what is the uh, means educati education uh, relation between the king and the Vidya Chagar? Whatever I have, probably I have heard about Vidya Chagar probably for one sec. Have you, have you uh, said about Vidya, Vidya Chagar? So it was a title. Yes. yes. Um, so my great grandfather was a prolific writer, and he was given the title of Vidya Sagar by the Banaras Pandit Sabha. Um, okay. Okay. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. I actually but confused. I with the, also have yeah. a question about the coat of arms, and um, because the coat of arms, that, I mean, um, that uh, that seems to be one of these coat of arms uh, uh, designed in the late nineteenth century by the uh, British, you know, I think it was just a, a personal initiative of someone for the uh, or something like this, right? Or do you know anything about the history of the coat of arms? 
So uh, our family's coat of arms that we use even till date was designed by my great grandfather. Um, I think he really enjoyed doing that because so our um, the older insignia of the family is the fish with the flags, the mina um, ketan, the ketan, which is what um, our craft initiative is named after. So mm. that's that. And then he designed his own coat of arms, which is used by us, uh, by the family. And he also designed the coat of arms for the Rajkumar College in Raipur, which they use till date. And we're very very proud of the association <laughs> with such a wonderful institution. Interesting. And so this, uh, the, uh, the, the Ravenshaw College is still a college? Yes, it was one of the earliest and premier colleges in Odisha and it still is one of the premier colleges of Odisha. Uh, he donated a vast sum in those days along with uh, the Maharaja of Mayurbhanj. Uh, but uh, he did not want his name anywhere, whether it was the medical college or the Ravenshaw College or the printing, or the printing press. press. So it is, has been documented, but there, there are no, no uh, plates to uh, say so there. I see. Are you involved with the college in some way or um, doing My father was there, but uh, the none of us have continued to really study there, no, not anymore. But yes, still my father-in-law, yes. I'm just wondering whether you have any initiatives like bring the children to the palace or have any kind of, you know, uh, heritage interpretation schemes or something like this, because we talked about this, your museum work. Yes, yes. It's a great idea, actually, Mimi. We have a lot of students coming from Dhenkanal and around Dhenkanal, because as mentioned, a lot of these schools, uh, Dhenkanal actually had the best education uh, at one time in Odisha. We had 127 schools. In the, in, in the Dhenkanal district. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do bring in a lot of uh, tour, uh, students who come and have a look. So it's, it's sort of like a little museum and they go around and we interact with them. Yes, we, we've also had the good fortune of having international students who've come for uh, rural education or for an experience here to help out in villages actually stay with us for a week and um, carry out their, um, their work in the villages nearby and use this as a base. And um, I think they've enjoyed themselves <laughs> here and we've enjoyed having yeah, and we welcome any students who want to come. Um, yeah, it would be great. Wonderful. Because I really feel there's a need for local history. Uh, because many, you know, if you look at the history education, it's very generalized and so on. But the local history is often not taught. So this is something also as a center for historic houses, we really like to encourage. And uh, we have students also, and we uh, will also be having more sessions in all as I said, with the Oxford University Heritage Network to actually design, you know, um, activities and so on for children um, when it comes to kind of material culture, local history and so on. So please get in touch. We uh, also would love to collaborate with you. Wonderful. So um, thank you very much. Um, it's, it was really a great honor, a great pleasure um, to have you and such a spirited way of um, telling the history. And, you know, when I see something like this, I'm really um, glad that we are doing this because this is important and um, this is just not being told. And I think we really need to hear about it. And you are filling the place um, with life and with so much meaning and, and you kind of use the tradition and you revive it in many, many ways. It's really lovely to see, to have such a lively place um, of, of, um, of culture. And heritage. Thank you so much, maybe for giving thank us yes, this wonderful platform, so and thank you so much, all our viewers. Yes, for, for sticking <laughs> thank to you. all the technical <laughs> glitches. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you very much, and see you next Friday. Bye bye. Thank you bye. so much. Thank you. Bye. bye.